are listening to Awake in Relationship, a podcast about intimacy, community, and culture in a time of great change, with Silas Rose. Greetings and uh, welcome to Awakened Relationship. My name is Silas Rose. So anyone that uh, knows me knows that I love to dance. And I uh, consider myself part of uh, an eclectic community of dancers here on uh, southern Vancouver Island and really kind of the west coast. There's been uh, an explosion of uh, ecstatic dance, or what some might call conscious dance. What makes it conscious really is a uh, intention to create a safe space, or dare I say, sacred space for exploring the uh, inner realms of emotion and leaning into our edge in terms of connecting to others through dance. In this container, I really find it's possible to have a, a paradoxical experience of vulnerability and, and freedom. I really believe it's the perfect medicine for this time when so many of us are struggling with isolation and uh, fear and uncertainty. It's really possible to create community, feel a sense of deep community with others without sharing a word. By simply moving together in rhythm, somehow it's possible to experience a real sense of wholeness and joy, even if it seems the world's falling apart. In this episode of Awaken Relationship, I, I speak with Anne-Marie Hoge, an occupational therapist and five rhythms dance facilitator, about meeting our vulnerability and taking risks on the dance floor. We also discuss dance as a mindfulness practice, and the connection between dance and daily life. So if you uh, have a regular dance practice or just love to move your body to music, please stay tuned. Emery, uh, good afternoon and welcome to Awaken Relationship. Thank you very much for having me here. So uh, we've had quite the year uh, in terms of Dancing with Fear. How has how's your practice been? My practice has been uh, up and down, and uh, or down and up, let me say that. it's There's been a practice the entire time, an internal movement, and I froze this year um, with something. We had a, a personal tragedy in our family um, uh, right before COVID, and so that was already a, a freeze in my body. And then with COVID, it was uh, r- responding in, a, in an internal way, and by the time I started to emerge in the spring, I started to put myself in April into my daily practice of dancing in the morning. And it was transformational to start moving again. And I just reminded myself of the power of motion and the power of, of dance and movement to get me unstuck and moving and back into a creative flow. So perhaps a, a good place to start a conversation is really... You know, tell us a little bit about um, some of your early experiences with dance. So I, well, my earliest uh, experience with dance was um, being five years old or four years old. And my mom put me in a, a, in a, in a, a, a class of a modern dance class and it was or a, a, a kid's class where I was a butterfly. So early on I took to, took to movement that's going way back, but really when I, I really connected with dance was in the um, mid nineties and in the afternoon I was doing a, a therapy for some, some um, talking therapy for something I needed to address. And I, in the morning of the, that was a Thursday af- afternoon and the Friday morning I would do a, um, a, a, a five person dance class and it was unrelated. But what I found was the connection of doing the talking and then doing the moving, moving in the morning, like completely shifted me. And I didn't put that together until a little bit, a bit through the therapy and, and found it was so powerful. And then I started to really, um, begin my exploration of, of movement as a, as a tool for healing and transformation mm. and freedom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think for most people, dance is sort of seen as, know something fun to do and i know for myself um for much of my adult life 
uh, you know, I'm going to clubs or raves or whatever, and I'm really getting into the dance, but it's really only been more recently I've seen it as a practice, as a kind of a, a personal development path. I know that's a big part of the kind of um, conscious dance movement and, and certainly five rhythms. What light switch turned on for you in that regard? Yeah. Well, I met Gabrielle Roth, the founder of the Five Rhythms, in 2000, and I, it was... It was this experience where I had been turned on by dance and started to um, uh, work on my own with with practicing just on my own and with different teachers and and offering. I was living up in the Yukon at the time and offering classes at the time. I called them passionate free movement, and um, and there was something in me that wanted to go deeper with people, and I knew where my edge was of learning. And I've, I read a book, uh, one of Gabrielle Roth's books and was completely fascinated because it was, it was this beautiful gateway into, um, uh, just movement as medicine really in, in, in a way that I had never uh, experienced before. So I, I ended up doing a, a search and, uh, found a month long program that she was doing in California and signed up and and had never met her before. And that basically blew me apart because what I saw of her, she was such an artist. She's, she's um, now passed, but she was such a brilliant artist and catalyst. And, um, and she would just come in the room and, um, and there were people from all over the world. And it was this, this blend of creativity and art and um, healing, and it wasn't it wasn't therapeutic, but it was therapy. Mm. So it, what I loved about it, it was a creative edge, and I love the creative edge, and that's what just exploded me to the to the practice. So you eventually went on to kind of do the training and uh, become a facilitator, and you're about twenty one. You said twenty one years into this. Uh, well. When I met, I met Gabrielle in uh, 2000 and actually started even a little bit before that in 1999 and, and, and met a um, uh, Five Rhythms teacher at the time and did a workshop. Um, but uh, my training was in 2007 and 2008. So I've been teaching the practice since then, but have been doing my personal practice since, since uh, 1999, 2000. Mm. You put in your 10,000 hours. Yeah, it feels like it, and it feels like it, it. It keeps on giving, really, to me, like the practice and and the teaching and the learning and being a student consistently. Even this morning, I was dancing on the beach, and something came up that pushed my edge in terms of oh, it's, you know, some some technical difficulty, and just continuing to um, learn and and grow. And so much of that growing is is really about uh, the music and. Um I, I dabble a little bit in DJing myself, so I've, I've over the years accrued some some good tunes. Yes. Uh, how do you uh, approach music, uh, playing music, DJing in a way to create those kind of peak states? Well, I I definitely choose music that that encourages creativity and movement. It can be from any genre and any any type of music, but it's it's. It's picking things that actually really move people. So I go a lot by instinct and intuition, the feel of a music, uh, a piece. And when I'm listening to it, it's like, how does it, how does it really grab me? And over the years, it's just being able to really trust and fine tune. When I hear it, hear something that I might enjoy just listening to, say in the car or at home, I won't necessarily use that to, uh, to use in a class. So it's really trusting my instinct and finding something that's going to evoke something. It could evoke emotion, a range of emotion. It could evoke f- something that, that energizes. So I categorize my music in a certain way. So it might be um, energy or tenderness or passion. So it depends on where I'm going and, and where I want to maybe take people in a particular class or workshop. When I, when I first started to get into conscious dance, uh, I felt very kind of stuck in my head. I think that might be a pretty common experience for newbies. I would get into sort of judging myself, uh, you know, judging my dance, judging other people's dance, which really um, 
put a kind of the kibosh on any sort of sense of enjoyment yeah. or or freedom. So there's there's a lot of self referencing that happens, at least for me personally, or there was. Uh, I'd like to think it's getting easier. <laughs> but what is it about that that makes us feel uh, so vulnerable? Uh, that's a great question. I I believe when we put ourselves into motion, in any kind of motion, it, it, it gets things moving. And it's not only the body, it can be the, the um, emotion or the emotional body too. And for a lot of us, that can be, um, can be exciting, but it also can be overwhelming. And, and so that's what I think is the power and of movement is to be able to actually have an experience where you are um, feeling something. And that can be really vulnerable for a lot of people. Also being seen or seeing others can be a, a, a really vulnerable place, you know, and that also I find that's, that's the power and, and the beauty of it is to actually, I, I really do believe we want to be seen and we want to be, be seen and see others. So I think the dra- dance can really strip that off where we can just be who we are a little bit more, even if it's, I feel really self-conscious and vulnerable but that's real. And, and that can be tender and vulnerable and really beautiful. And it's very much a a push pull thing because, you know, certainly after 16 months of, you know, social distancing and isolation, we really crave that. Uh, but in the same time, uh, fear it. That's right. And so what I find is also my work as an occupational therapist and I, I, I work, um, basically out in the community with people and, and it's, it is, it's that, it's that, which I think is sort of an interface with dance too, is that like any of us, whether we're in our homes or on the dance floor, it is this vulnerable of, of coming out and, and coming back in and, and being seen again. So that's, that's really similar to what has been happening with COVID. When I go see people in their houses, they might be shut up there and haven't been out and to go to the grocery store that's scary for them other people it's like uh, being on a dance floor is scary to get back in or it's exciting so there can be this push pull and vulnerability and open and close in any parts of our life as a facilitator uh what 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 are some of the intangible qualities of the space that you create that that enables that sense of safety where people can explore movement and, and connection I find that just holding space, I, I, I really feel in a sense, it maybe it sounds a bit strange, but there's sort of like an energetic holding and not in a, in a strange way, but it's being able to see and, and, and know who's in the space. So I, I really pay particular attention to that. I think also the use of, uh, as a, as a facilitator, and I think, you know, just, just all, all facets of my life, I believe in in welcoming people and, and being inclusive. And so I, I feel like that really sets a stage in terms of um, giving people permission to be who they are and welcoming them and to normalize um, what the experience is. Because just like someone coming in for the first time, and I may have danced for a long time, I still have fears and get stuck and, and get in my head. And I think to be able to present that and, and share that and, and uh, encourage people sets a stage for safety. And when I mean safety, it still can be very scary for people and I can't control what happens on the inside, but I can hold a container to, um, to, to be able to go, Hey, I see you. I'm watching. If anything, um, happens that you can't handle, Mm. I can be there to at least witness and support and facilitate if need be. You know, if someone's feeling like, Oh, that emotionally, um, caught me or something happened or I'm feeling frozen. You know, if I see something, then I may even give some cues for that one person in the room and everyone else benefits. And that person doesn't even know but it's being able to to just watch and 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 follow sort of with my instinct in in the present moment. Can you describe a what a typical kind of class or session might look like? So, I would play music, 
generally the whole time. Right now I'm doing some some uh, series of sessions on the beach. Uh, so and it's to headsets because that's the, the right now the adaptation for for COVID. But um, but whether it's in inside or outside, I'll be playing music that I've that I've mixed, um, or I'm, I might mix live, or I'll uh, pre-mix. Um, in the case of being outside right now, so I'll have music playing. I'll have some prompts for people. Sometimes I'll stop a class and just and just give maybe a theme or something that that we'll be working on. And um, generally in a in an hour to two hour class, that's what will happen. And we'll go through a wave of music, which means we'll rise up and then we'll come back down. And then at the end, there'll be some quiet. And maybe there'll be a, a, a little bit of uh, check in at the end. But that's generally what will happen, what will happen in a class. So people will have a facilitated experience, but also have this real freedom to, to dance um, the way they want. What do, what do you think are some of the, the common fears that uh, people who show up, or maybe it's not even just fears, like what, what do people come in the door with that's a consistent theme right now that, that they're trying to work on through dance? That would be definitely personal for everybody, but some of the common things, and I can even talk with from personal experience because it's my own life journey, is um, especially earlier on of some people have a, a, a f- it can be a struggle to be in in a group. So sometimes it's that self consciousness of being in a group, uh, being seen, being you know that fear of being judged, the fear of not looking you know dancing in a certain way, or they look across and see someone say dancing in a certain um, capacity, or or what they think is uh, like they're a good dancer, and then and then they may not feel that themselves. And I'm really clear on um, it doesn't matter how much people move everyone's a dancer and it's a personal journey and there can be so much going on when there's a, 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 an outward lack of movement so those are some of the common pieces i think there's also um, the place of people coming in and and just not knowing like i don't know what this is going to be like and i i don't know what's going to happen so there can be just that general which which happens in lots of times in life you know where where they we take brave steps to do something that we feel would we're drawn to, and we're just sort of that fear of the unknown of I don't know what this is going to be like, and maybe I won't like it, mm. and that's fair enough. And but that's but that's that's what people can come with, and also just generally people can just like any of us because it's a moving field and we're not trying to put on masks, you know, it's like we're, we're actually stripping down to, to just get in our bodies and, and move with what's real. Sometimes people come in with the day or I know people will be dealing with um, people in their lives who are dying or, or um, going through conflict in, in their personal life and they'll come in, you know, in a variety of states and, and there's permission to just be who they are in the space and, and bring that with. How, how do you manage your own sort of expectations, judgments, and fears oh. when you're facilitating? <laughs> oh, yeah. I handle it by just being with it in the moment. It's a perfect example. This morning, something came up. As I said, there were some technical difficulties. Uh, and it was so beautiful to just still be with that and and go, okay, here it is. I trust my instinct a lot. So I just go, okay, you know, I'm going to do what I, I need to do to sort this out. But I also, my particular style and way is to be really honest about that. So I'll say, hey, we've got some technical difficulties or look at this, this, this happened. And I'll be really honest with that. And I, f- I, I find the process of revealing, number one, it normalizes it for others it gives permission for not getting it right. And I'm doing the little quotation marks as I do that, not getting it right. And it also, um, it also just gives me that freedom to go, Oh, okay. That's that in the moment. And let's, let's get back in. So that's what comes up. I also find how I manage is I really, at this point along my practice and in, in life, I, I really do things to take care of myself and ground myself. And in terms of, you know, um, my, uh, putting myself in motion. So, so it could be if I'm, if I'm 
scared or frozen or something comes up, then I actually start dancing, you know, and it can be right in that moment. And then I get myself unstuck. And sometimes I'll say, I'm just, you know, I can't think of the right word. I'm going to, I'm just going to move here and I'm going to drop that. So there's that honesty, that putting myself in motion and also just taking care of myself and trusting, trusting my instinct. I've definitely been in the kind of leadership capacity in di- different settings, you know, with uh, facilitation or teaching. One of the things I, I get hooked up around is is really around mirroring, you know, that I, I interpret that people are, are not getting value from what I'm offering or, you know, if someone has a reaction, then I start to react and then it just becomes this um, intense feedback cycle. That can happen regularly and I, I find where especially in movement where I'm looking out and someone may not be moving. Someone may be lying down and I'm, I'm facilitating something where, where it can be completely different than that. And so I also will go through things in my head of like, you know, just trusting again, trusting that that particular person has their particular process. And I'll, and I'll sometimes, um, again, just for the group, will say it doesn't matter what this looks like you know and so I'll, I'll I'll work with that and I know enough now that that whatever it looks like out there on the dance floor it I, I have no idea what what's going on in the on the inside so they might have be having a, 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 an incredibly profound experience or not but it's not for me to judge that and to interpret that, because when I do that, I find that then I'm, 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 I'm out of my, out of sort of out of my body. And so then I just try to come back in and go, how can I come right back here? And again, go back to the practice, go back to my breath, go back to my body and get back into that piece of trusting, trusting, and also not, you know, trying to be in this place of a little bit less attachment to what the outcome is and just be of service really. Mm-hmm. Uh, like come back to that, that I'm here to be of service. And if, if people are moving, then, then that's the main thing, whether it's internal or external. It seems like there's, there's kind of a a mutual softening or opening that's happening. One of the things I really appreciate about your classes is that you, you take a lot of risks where you're encouraging people to lean into their edge, whatever that might be for them. What do you hope that people will discover on the other side of that edge? I see life is, is this opportunity and especially in the five rhythms practice to be in relationship with ourselves, with the other, with the group and in movement, specifically when we get on the dance floor, there's this beautiful opportunity to keep learning. You know, some people don't like being with themselves. Some people don't like being with others or that scares them. When I say don't like it can be that, that can be really scary. Some people can like or dislike being in a group. So I think those pieces and and if people me encouraging people to take brave steps really can help i think just give information and and support people in other parts of their lives taking brave steps into into relationship with others and themselves or in the group let's talk a little bit more about that do do you see that you know obviously with your own practice but also with people you work with is there this uh, crossover from what is explored on the dance floor and what people encounter in daily life. Absolutely, I I I see the I see the dance floor as I mean real life, but what we come in with, and if we can sometimes break free of things and 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 move things around, it really influences other parts of uh, of our life. And and when I'm stuck in other parts of my life, that can come into the dance floor too. This has been my whole journey with dance, my whole two decades plus is that I've seen myself shift and change so much. It doesn't, it's not that I'm better than I was before. It's more that there's more, more revealing of who, who I am as an essence and confidence and, um, and freedom in being who I am. And I find that, that that's what happens on the dance floor is that there's a crossover when we take those steps and when I can, you know, through humor and through um, openness and through just being authentic and real myself, if I can encourage people to do that, which I do in all parts of my personal life and personal practice, my professional practice, I'm assisting people in taking steps. 
taking risky steps in a low risk situation, because really going into the dance floor is low risk. It is really low risk, although internally it can feel very dangerous and high risk. So in life and on the dance floor, I'm encouraging people to take low risk situations that might feel risky and it builds confidence and competence in other parts of their lives. We both uh, practice mindfulness meditation. How has that informed your dance? I see them being beautifully, beautifully complementary, like really powerfully complementary. What I see is is dance being a movie meditation, this practice being a movie meditation and a dance. Whereas when I'm sitting, there's so much moving inside and it's me actually moving with that sitting still, like just being aware and sitting with with all, say, my emotions and my racing thoughts and and my wanting to to move or feeling anxiety in my in my um, abdomen. When I'm sitting, it helps me tolerate being human more and more. It helps me tolerate my feelings. When I'm dancing, it helps me tolerate being human and even celebrating being human more and more. So I see them as really complementary. I also find that interface of of the stillness, not necessarily that meditation can be stillness, but I can be still with things that are going on and be grounded a lot more in life. And that influences when things come up on the dance floor or when I'm teaching and holding space, as we talked about earlier, me looking out and maybe something happens in terms of my technical, I can hold, I can hold that that distress, even though I might feel distressed about it, I can hold my ground and, 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 and witness myself and continue moving forward without freezing. We're kind of uh, 16 months into this COVID journey and, you know, with Delta, it really just kind of seems endless that uh, we don't know how long we're going to be in this kind of limbo state. And certainly that's put the kibosh on many dance opportunities, unfortunately. And I know that you are adapting how, how do you see dance helping uh, us get through this pandemic? Well, in the beginning here, I, I haven't transitioned to being online like a lot of my colleagues. As I said, we had a we had a um, something happen in our family, and that was that was my focus. Uh, and I've seen so many people adapt and and change, and and that's been fantastic. So people have been able to to continue to move. Uh, so I think that's one way that things have shifted. It, it has really opened up the ways that the creative ways that we can connect and, and move uh, as well as now shifting to the outdoors like myself and um, a lot of colleagues, especially in the Victoria area. And I think that is a huge potential. I, so when I say that there's headsets, headphones, and you can hear the, you can hear the music through the headphones and you can hear the facilitator speaking. So it's this amazingly intimate experience, but someone can be like 300 meters, like a, such a far range down having their own experience and they can still hear. And, and you're very much immersed in, in a natural environment. Yes. Outside. Yeah. Absolutely. You don't have to do it outside, but, but a lot of us have been doing it outside. So, so it brings a, a completely different element. Yesterday I had rain for the first time. It's been, it's been uh, hot and sunny, not so helpful for our province of British Columbia with forest fires, but it has been, um, it was raining yesterday. And at first I was like, Oh, rain, (laughs) what are we going to do here? And it was fantastic. It was, we, we got to be in the elements, uh, dancing. It was, it was, it was beautiful. So I think there's a lot of ways, at least for me, I can only speak, um, personally here. I'm now that there's more fluidity and, and creativity coming out now that I put myself into into practice. I think there's a lot of opportunities to just get really creative and, and support people in continuing to heal, thrive, expand, and connect with themselves, with others. And, and ultimately, if, if people want, is to to um, be of service in the world like just by, by getting back into their own bodies. That's probably a, a great place to end our conversation. Thank you so much, Emery. Yeah, it's been such a pleasure to be here. I, I mean this. How can uh, people learn more about you and your work? I do have a website, and it is uh, annemariehogia.com. And uh, last name is spelled H-O-G-Y-A, Hungarian gypsy. <laughs> but uh, So they can find out uh, uh, stuff I'm up to there. 
We'll see you on the dance floor. Thanks again to Amory for this chat and for holding space for dance in such a special way. If you want to learn more about her work, head over to amoryhongya.com or check out the show notes at awakerelationship.com. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, you might want to also have a listen to episode 14 with Sean Devlin, who's another great jewel in the dance community, talking about dance your ability. If you're loving the content uh, on Awake Relationship, I'd really appreciate you just taking a moment and leaving a quick review on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts. It really helps me to grow the show, so thank you. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter, and please send me a message if you have any feedback or uh, ideas for, for future shows. So until next time, keep dancing and stay connected. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Awake in Relationship. If you liked what you heard, please click subscribe to get the latest show delivered fresh to your device or sign up for our newsletter at awakeinrelationship.com. Sharing is caring. 